Fine Nano S is quiet, compact, and it's built for many ITX water-cooled systems just like this one. But watch out, if you get one, Josh might just show up at your house randomly. The fractal design to Fine Nano S is small, quiet, and built for many ITX water-cooled systems just like this one. But if you get one, watch out, because Fractal Josh might just show up at any minute. You know, Kyle's full of shit. Ugh. Well, that was immersive. Yeah, Paul's still not here yet. We've been here for like an hour. Dude, let's get the hell out of here. Screw it. <sighs> So remember back when there were almost no GTX 1080s on the market? Now there's almost too many, from the NVIDIA Founders Edition to all the various varieties of third-party designs. So how is a custom card like Gigabyte's GTX 1080 Extreme Gaming to differentiate itself from the others? Well, five different ways, I think. Cooling, noise, aesthetics, overclocking, and extras, like accessories and stuff. So let's start with accessories, and by the way, this version that Gigabyte sent over is the Extreme Gaming Premium Pack, which is $700 right now, or the same price as the Founders Edition, when it's in stock, of course. There's some very professional looking paperwork, which does have details on the four year warranty, which is a very nice long warranty, so that's good. There's also that wrist protector in there that you've always wanted, a double six pin to eight pin peg power cable, an XMP 300 mouse pad with stitched edges that also seems to be pretty good quality, an HDMI and USB 3.0 quarter inch front panel bay that gives you extra connectivity on the front of your case for the extra HDMI plugs on the card itself, an expansion slot bracket if you want to route those HDMI ports to the back of the case, an extreme gaming two-way high bandwidth SLI bridge with a white LED logo and one slot spacing, and the ever important extreme gaming case badge. All in all, a nice kit of accessories with some good value added, especially if you need that high bandwidth SLI bridge. Aesthetics is next. This card has sort of an angular industrial design, definitely distinct from the Founders Edition. And while some of the exposed heatsink fins can get bent pretty easily, I found, I do think it's a pretty good looking design overall. It's a triple slot open cooler with RGB LED lights on the Extreme Gaming logo and the fan stop light, which lights up when the fans stop. And yes, that can be disabled. Uh, and there's also RGB LEDs on the X pattern that's over the fans themselves. You get three 100 millimeter double ball bearing fans with the center fan tucked underneath the two outer fans and spinning in the opposite direction. Gigabyte says this doubles the airflow where they overlap, which totally makes sense because there's two fans, so twice as much. It's science. Uh, it does seem to cool pretty well though. The shroud is made of metal and it's black with silver and orange accents. The orange is pretty minimal here, but I would have preferred a neutral color to give more flexibility for the RGB LED lighting. The back plate is black metal and it also has two thin orange racing stripes going along the length. The entire card is 11.4 inches or 289 millimeters long, and if you couldn't already tell, it's a custom PCB design with two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors. Of course, it's also got NVIDIA's 16 nanometer, 7.2 billion transistor Pascal-based GP104 GPU in there, so all the same specs as the other GTX 1080s on the market, as well as 8 gigabytes of 256-bit GDDR5X memory at 10,000 megahertz effective clock speed. Video arts are three DisplayPort 1.4s, one HDMI 2.0B, one DVI, and then the other two HDMI ports on the other side of the card internally, which are intended to provide front panel connectivity for VR head mounted displays. They can also just be used as regular HDMI ports. You don't have to use them for VR, but you could connect them with extensions uh, to the front or the back of your PC with the included accessories that I already showed you. Onward to overclocking, Gigabyte told me that the Extreme Gaming 1080 does not use BIN GPUs, so the overclocking was pretty standard. Pretty much all the typical 1080s out there hit about 2100 to 2150 megahertz max frequency when overclocked, and then after temps even out under full load, they usually run in the 2000 to 2100 range. This card was no different, hitting just over 2100 max, but fortunately only pulling back to about 2075 under load, which I think is attributable to the improved cooling and power delivery compared to the Founders Edition. Here are some 3D Mark Fire Strike results with the overclock running, just to show you what kind of performance lift you can expect if you go this route. For benchmarks, I'm going to change things up a little bit and run some live gameplay testing, kind of like I did with my RX 480 21x9 video last week. You can check that out right there. I played each game in the preset OC mode at 2560x1440 and 4K. You can see the on-screen frame rates as I play, and I recorded the screen so screen capping wouldn't conflict with the results. So let's start with some Doom using the Vulkan API at 2560x1440. Alright, so we're playing some Doom. Uh, I have it set to Vulcan. It's using Vulcan, so the uh, on-screen displays here in the top right, that'll have the frame rate. 
as far as video settings go, uh, starting off at 2560 by 1440 FXAA, and then uh, we have set to the ultra quality pretty much, and of course, Vulcan. No. No. Not bad at all. Vulcan definitely gives some added performance compared to DirectX 11. Now let's try 4K 3840 by 2160. Okay, moving on to some GTA 5. I'm set up for 2560 by 1440 right now. Um, everything's mostly set to very high with some stuff set to high. You can see all the settings right here. And I've also set up the webcam so you guys can get a closer look at the actual frame rate. Okay, we are now at 4K, 3840 by 2160. Everything else is pretty much the same. Uh, no AA, and everything else is at high or very high. Oh, I dodged you, sir. Now watch as I just gas this monster van. Just gonna easily outrun these police cars. Uh, maybe not. Okay, moving on to uh, some Overwatch, because why not? So starting off, back at 2560 by 1440, uh, we are at epic graphics quality, and I've set the render scale to 100% to make sure that it doesn't automatically change it, because that kind of messes with your actual results. Anyway, just gonna uh, play a quick play game. Alright, so as you can hopefully see by me dying repeatedly, um, my frame right here, it's been fluctuating. It's definitely fluctuating more. Um, but yeah, my, my, my frame rate's been fluctuating a little bit, but generally in the low range has been in the 110 to 120. And then uh, beyond that, it's been, it has been peaking at like, you know, 130 to 150 in certain situations, but you know. I, I don't know. I don't know how, how to explain that exactly. Oh look, I eliminated someone. And finally, here's some epic settings. Overwatch at 4K. So we're seeing 60 to 70 frames per second, maybe up to 80. Not too bad at all. Again, we're at 4K playing Overwatch at uh, epic settings. So if you've got a 60 hertz 4K monitor like I do, it's right about where you want to be. Gigabyte's Extreme Engine software can be used for overclocking, fan control, and LED lighting. For overclocking, it gets the job done. It has all the necessary sliders that it needs, but I think it still needs some additional features in my professional opinion. Specifically, the monitoring window, which can be popped out but cannot be resized. And also, it does not show any min and max values over time or any values when you mouse over the histogram. So I'll be sticking with MSI Afterburner or EVGA Precision X for now. Anyway though, the LED control is there and can be used to set the LEDs to solid color, breathing, flashing, or reactive modes based on GPU temperature or load, for example. Uh, you can choose a single color 
or the rainbow mode. And you can also punch in RGB or hex color values for the single color, which is actually a really great option to have. And while you can't control the individual lighting areas on the card, you can control the lighting for two different extreme gaming GPUs and the SLI bridge at the same time all via the software. So I've talked about aesthetics, overclocking, and extras, but what about cooling and noise? Cooling is awesome on this card. I don't know if it's the overlapped fans or the huge triple slot design or what, but this is the coolest running 1080 that I have tested, hitting only 60C max under load while testing. Uh, ambient temperatures, by the way, were steady 77 to 88 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 to 27 degrees Celsius. This is using the stock fan profile and the OC mode in the extreme gaming software. As for fan noise, I will let you listen for yourself. Here's the fan at idle or zero fan mode. Here's 40%, which was about the average speed under load. Here's 70%, which is what the fan would hit if the GPU ever got up to 80 degrees C, which it never even got close to. And here's the fan at 100% speed, just to hear what it sounds like. And now it's conclusion time. So based on those five criteria, cooling, noise, aesthetics, overclocking, and extras, Gigabyte has designed a very nice GTX 1080 in the extreme gaming. With all the extra stuff you get for the $700 price tag, this kit should be a no-brainer compared to the Founders Edition, but there are other third-party designs to consider. If you like Gigabyte's design, aesthetically, if you want a cool and quiet card, and if you are interested in a two-way SLI configuration in the future, I think it's a relatively good value. If I were to ask for more, I would have liked to see binned GP use in this card like they did with the Extreme Gaming 900 series, as overclocking wasn't really any more or less impressive than other cards like the EVGA GTX 1080 for the win, or even very much over the Founders Edition if you don't consider temperatures and throttling. The orange accents also need to go, and it would be nice to see more protection for the cooling fins that protrude and just seem very prone to getting bent. Of course, there's also the VR features to consider, and front HDMI ports for a head-mounted display are pretty damn useful in a lot of situations. I'm very curious to hear what you guys think of this card, though, so leave me your comments in the comments section down below. Links to this card on Amazon and my Paul's Hardware store where you can buy shirts are down there as well. Hit the like button and get subscribed if you enjoyed, and as always, thank you very much for watching my videos.